I've written many times that I don't think there's a, a better looking place in the world than Northern Indiana in, in early June. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's where I grew up in, I, it's where I, it's still my home, even though there's no one there anymore. Yeah. But it's, it's still, uh, still who I am. Before we, before we leave here, what do you call that when you're pulling the steam on that steam engine? You call that jacking or what I is don't know what they, I don't know what they call, we just call it boiler up. <laughs> okay, let's see what they, what they call what, it, but this you, move just means boiler up. Well, you know what that's from? That's from grabbing the whistle on a steam engine. Right, right. I, I get that part of it. Okay, all right. Give us that. I'm not sure they're doing much that anymore, but. Yeah, but, but <laughs> give us a couple of those on our way out here, Dave. All right, here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Boil her up. Boil her up. <laughs> Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind, conversations on leadership, coaching, and team building. Your host, Terry Pettit, led the University of Nebraska Cornhusker volleyball team from 1977 to 1999 and coached Nebraska's first ever national championship in 1995. Today, Coach Pettit mentors coaches, authors books, and presents to corporations and businesses on leadership and team building. Dave Shondell is beginning his 19th season as the head coach of Purdue's women's volleyball team. His father, Dr. Don Shondell, played a significant role in developing coaches and promoting the sport while building and coaching the men's volleyball team at Ball State University. I'm Dave Young, producer of the podcast. Thanks for joining us. And now, here's Coach Terry Pettit. Dave, welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind. It's, it's wonderful to have you. As you know, we, we tried to plan this during the season, and we were going to have uh, your dad on and, and your two, uh, two brothers and Unfortunately, your dad passed away in, in November. And my understanding is that you're going to have a celebration of life in March. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, dad passed away uh, in early December. And um, he had been really a, a pretty healthy man for a long time in the last couple of years. Uh, start with a broken hip and a few other things. And then eventually COVID um, kind of got him. But we are going to celebrate his almost 93 years of life uh, on March 19th. The event will be in Muncie at Ball State University in Worthen Arena. Um, right next to Worthen Arena is the Don Shondell you know, practice facility that was built in his honor, which is pretty neat. We'll have a reception there after the uh, celebration of life. And then Ball State will play Ohio State in men's volleyball that night at 7 PM, which is one of the greatest rivalries in all of volleyball. And that will be fun. And then uh, for uh, family and friends and alumni, Ball State Volleyball alumni, there'll be a social function, of course, that will follow that match. So it will be a full day of uh, remembering Dr. Don and trying to continue to, to build on the great start that Ball State's men's volleyball team has had under a new, new head coach. Uh, really a great, you, I, I know that you beat uh, number one Hawaii twice I think you split with BYU well, where's uh, where's the team currently ranked well uh, that came out today I think and I did not see it I've been pretty busy with uh, recruiting today uh, but they beat Lewis at Lewis and then beat McKendry at McKendry this past weekend that may sound simple but it's not we, we have not beaten Lewis uh, in Romeoville in in probably 15 years Wow. So that was a really good win for Donan Cruz and, and the, the Cardinals. So uh, they should have jumped up to five or six. I don't know where the coaches put them, but I would have put them at five or six. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I kind of group uh, your father with Jim Coleman. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I group one other woman in, in there in that generation. It's probably not right, but I think of Mary Jo Pepler as having a similar type influence. Although the, your father and Jim uh, w were probably more alike in several ways. Jim coached at George Williams College and uh, was a, a national team coach. Both of them were um, very welcoming, uh, you know, really recruited people to the sport. Did they have a, a personal relationship Oh yeah, very close personal relationship. And uh, they, they actually loved each other. Uh, I, I think that would be fair to say. And they were educators first. Uh, I think promoters of the game second and maybe coaches third. I think both of them um, would rather be known for, I think, generating 
interest in the game over what their win-loss record was at the end of their career. Uh, true pioneers of the sport of volleyball in this country. And as you know, the ABCA would always have a, a doubles tournament um, at the convention. And uh, Jim and dad would always team up and play I, in that doubles competition. I did not know that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but uh, they, they've known each other for a long, long time. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Jim was at George Williams College. And people are thinking, George Williams College, where is that? Well, think about Russ Rose and Jerry Angle and Bill Walton and so many that played at George Williams College, um, many for uh, Jim Coleman that went on to do great things. And of course, the Ball State legacy is, is also very strong. Yeah, the third gentleman that would be in that in that tryout would be Carl McGowan at, yes. um, at at Utah. And Carl's, I think, niche was was uh, more technical, uh, uh, using statistics, and uh, uh, he did a lot certainly in the western part of the country. But certainly, your dad and Jim had a major impact in the east and the Midwest. Um, the three of you, the three sons. Um, your dad coached for 34 years, and I think I think I read somewhere where Steve coached for 34 years. Does that sound right? That sounds pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Steve was, of course, at Burris High School, where I think he won 22 state championships and then went to Ball State and coached the women's team there for, I think, maybe five seasons before yeah, going six back. Six seasons. Yeah. Six? Yeah. Okay, before going back to Burris for a couple more. Yeah. And, you know, Steve is actually uh, was recently announced as the most successful high school coach ever in the state of Indiana in any sport. In any sport. Well, yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. And that's certainly well deserved. I, I know that when he was coaching at Burris and you were coaching at Muncie Central, you said that uh, he was certainly the best recruiter in the family. <laughs> you remember that. Uh, well, no. Bur Burris was a, was called a, was a, a lab school for Ball State and it the entire state was its boundary. It wasn't a very big school, uh, but there was a selection committee that was formed that determined who got in each year to the to Burris. And one was the Sasha Kaldemeyer's mom, and Sasha was maybe the greatest player that ever played over there. One was the uh, uh, statistical man for Steve, and I think the other was the athletic director. So that was the committee that was determining which females would come into Burris each year, and usually two thirds of them were volleyball players. How intense was the um, was that rivalry when you were at uh, Muncie Central and and uh, the two two of you were ranked first or second in the state? Yeah, it was it was more intense than a high school rivalry should be. And uh, you know the funny thing is is that Thanksgiving was right around normally the start of state tournament play, and uh, I can remember going over and having some real brouhaha's. Uh, with my brother Steve over Thanksgiving about different things that were going on. And occasionally I would walk out of uh, Steve's home. Steve actually lived for a long time with my mom and dad, uh, as you probably remember. I, I With the NFL curtains in, the, in his bedroom. Yeah. yeah. And occasionally I'd walk out with some Burris videotapes from some of their matches after some of those Thanksgiving meals just to make <laughs> sure I had the, the most updated uh, uh, videotape available. But uh, no, it was, it was, it was pretty heated. And that's why when, um, when John and I came here to Purdue, uh, all of a sudden everybody was on the same team, and and that was a pretty nice move because it was it was a little bit unruly at times. And and actually, John, my younger brother John, went to Newcastle. Newcastle is a high school most known for Steve Alford, where Steve Alford and Kent Benson, uh, great basketball players, went to school. But that's where John was coaching, um, and that they became very good under John's leadership. Right. And when they went to class sports, we were no longer playing Burris anymore, but we were playing John's team at Newcastle. So then we were right back in the same situation same again, where one of us was going to lose early in the tournament and the other one would normally go to the, to win the championship. In Newcastle, I, I grew up, you know, in a basketball family at, at one time, Newcastle had the largest high school gym in the country. Yeah. Is that still the case? Or? Well, they call it the largest and finest high school gym. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it is anymore because all those bleachers, portable bleachers that used to be up on top, mm -hmm. somehow those disappeared and they lost about 1,500 seats. Now, I think Sam Alford, who used to coach there and is the father of uh, Steve, uh, did some fundraising this last couple of years 
to put those bleachers back in there. So they st they may now be the largest. But the state of Indiana, as you know, Terry, has probably 15 uh, gyms that seat over 7,000 people for high school. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what's, what's so different about this age, uh, I can remember when I was a, a senior in high school hearing about Rick Mount uh, down in uh, near Indianapolis. Lebanon. We, we didn't have video then. No. You know, and so he, he was... Uh, First time I ever saw him was on the cover of Sports Illustrated as a, as a high school senior, but you would hear stories. People would talk about him. We had a kid at Manchester College called the Casiasco County Jumping Jack. Uh -huh. I mean, that's, yeah, that, those those types of things happen. Now I doubt if there's a uh, a volleyball player in the state that every college coach hasn't seen on video at 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 some point or other. Uh, you have access to everybody that uh, you want to see and more. Uh, right. And it comes in on a daily basis. You know, I was just, like I said, we had a recruit on campus today and I was talking to uh, a parent and I said, look at, look at the, the emails I've received today on, on, on this, on his phone. And there's like 30 of them that came in just today uh, for players as the recruiting is just about to begin as we open up the, uh, the club recruiting business here pretty quickly. But, you know, you talked about Rick Mount, Rick Mount came back, recently to Purdue, probably three years ago. He had, he had not been back to Purdue since he left. He never graduated. He never, didn't graduate from Purdue. And, uh, and then his son, Richie Mount, came to Purdue and played for Gene Cady for about a year and didn't get much playing time, and he left. So there was a little love loss there. Finally, Matt Painter, our current coach, mended that fence. And so Mount comes back, and I made an a intention of running into him while he was up on our, our floor here. And uh, he said, oh, volleyball coach. He said, I played volleyball at Purdue. I played on the, on the men's club team. He, he said, until my coach found out I was playing. And then he said, you're not, <laughs> you're not here to play volleyball, son. You're here to play basketball. So Rick Mount actually had some volleyball experience. He said he loved to jump and hit that ball. There was a kid from my high school named Den Denny Gamoff, who okay. was a, a freshman, sophomore, I believe, when Mount was a junior and senior. And Denny started at, at least as a sophomore. Okay. He's the only kid I've ever seen do this. He shot equally well with either hand from any distance. And it was, that was just unbelievable at that yeah. time. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone, anyone develop that skill, but certainly we both grew up in a state that was um, in love with basketball. I, I don't, I don't think any movie approaches Hoosiers for being a, uh, I think it's the best coaching movie that I've ever run across. Yeah. Uh, and and I, the, the amount of uh, attention to detail that goes into that movie, um, I think I think is wonderful. Um, but it's the stuff that happens beneath the surface that people don't get to see. And I, in, in doing a little research about your dad today, I know there were two or three times where he really had the battle for the program. One was to to uh, have it become a varsity sport. And then I think maybe around 2000, uh, there was an AD that considered removing it. Talk about the initial battle to uh, yeah. have men's, men's volleyball become a varsity sport. Yeah, well, you know, my dad never knew a thing about volleyball until he came to Ball State. And uh, he ended up was a, was a SIGEP in the SIGEP fraternity, which um, a lot of the, athletes were were sig eps but he he started to uh, be attracted to this uh this game of volleyball in the men's club team and he wasn't very good but they had a club team and he and he played on it and he kind of helped lead the club team and then he went in the after he graduated he went in the army and uh, he was at fort leonard wood in missouri rolla missouri near rolla missouri and same same outfit that whitey herzog was at he and whitey were pretty good friends at uh, at that particular um uh place and uh but he continued to coach there he was fortunate enough one time he was walking by the uh, uh the sergeant's place where all, the, all these guys were meeting about assigning positions to people and dad happened to walk in to ask a question he said you're the guy we're looking for and so they made him the athletic director of uh, fort leonard wood and so he didn't have to go overseas it was during the korean korean war so he kind of lucked out and, and uh he got into coaching a lot that way and then 
Uh, upon leaving there, he went to Brook, Indiana, which you may not know where that is. It's where, near Rensselaer, which you may not know where that is either. No, but no I've, I've played it yeah. in Rensselaer, in Rensselaer's gym. Yeah. yeah, the Bombers. And uh, so it's not too far from Lafayette, to be honest. But um, and he was there for probably five years, teaching and coaching. Uh, I think he taught industrial tech most of the time that he was there, industrial uh, arts, I think it was called back in the day. And uh, then Ball State called and said, would you like to be our intramural director? Because dad was very involved in that when he was there as an undergrad. And he said, yeah, I'd love to come back. So he came back. And after about six months, they asked him to start coaching this men's club team. And the thing about dad is he always had a vision. It wasn't about just keeping anything status quo. He always wanted to, to make progress. And he, he saw uh, this men's club team becoming a varsity sport. He didn't understand why they weren't getting the same things that baseball, basketball, football, track and field. Uh, and that was all I was probably there at that point in time. So uh, he took it to the, uh, the athletic director and he was not met with much promise, but he kept working at it. And eventually all the head coaches formed this committee and there was also one student on the committee. And so dad spent, you know, weeks talking to the different coaches on Ball State staff, all these different sports about why this should be done. Meanwhile, the athletic director was talking to those same coaches saying why this was a picnic sport. We weren't going to let, you know, volleyball be part of our, our men's athletic program. At the end of the day, the vote was nine to nine, and it was broken by this student that said, we want volleyball. And Jim Hinga, who was the, uh, the men's basketball coach at that time, walked, stormed out, ran his fist through a, a chalkboard on his way out because he had voted against volleyball. But at the end of the day, volleyball was started back in about 1961, same year it started at UCLA, and, uh, and, and history was made. And uh, that's where we are now. And so that's how guys like Mick Haley and Arnie Ball and, and the others kind of got started. Tom Beerman was on one of those really early teams. Uh, and it became a varsity, it actually it became a varsity sport after Beerman uh, finished his um, eligibility. So that's why he's not allowed to be in the, the Hall of Fame at Ball State, because it was not a varsity sport while he was there, which is too you bad. You say so he's, he's, he's not allowed? He's not in the, in the Hall of Fame, which is that's a real true. shame, because Beerman may have been the best single volleyball player to ever play. This is, this is Tom, Chris's dad. As we know, Chris passed away uh, right. about a year ago uh, with COVID. Um, and they were a lot alike. Tom and, and, and his son, Chris, were really similar in how they played and how they competed. Well, no one's going to be interested in this next fact. Um, <laughs> but when I first joined Kenneth Allen and was given a yeah. uniform, I was given Tom Bierman's uniform yeah, with right. his, his name on the back. <laughs> until I could get yeah. a jersey that had uh, my own name on the back. Yeah. I, how, how strong a player was Chris? Uh, was, oh. he, was he the best? The best ever? Chris was certainly the best in his era. Um, number one, his competitiveness was off the chart. Sometimes difficult to play with because he was so competitive. Setting Chris Beerman was not uh, a fun uh, job because Chris was never really very happy with what Did the- Did you play there at the same set. time? No, no, no. I, I played some, some club ball with Chris later, uh -huh. okay? Um, I think Johnny may have played a year with, with Beerman. Uh, Rick, uh, Chris Cooper was the guy that set the ball most of the time. Um, to Beerman and, and Cooper was a great setter, a great setter, but still wasn't good enough at times for Beerman. But Beerman um, was a great defensive player, passed the court well, physical, about 6'4", you know, and, and just really physical. And uh, he led Ball State to some really good, good teams. That was a, a pretty good time in Ball State volleyball history. Yeah, it was certainly a sad day uh, when he passed. And, and, yeah. and that, that was from COVID, wasn't it? Yes, it sure was. And and he got it and he was gone really quick. And that's, that's when I realized that that was this COVID was for real because here was a mountain of a man that was as healthy as, as an ox and, uh, and COVID got him in a short amount of time. So I, I knew it was for real. You know, and then, and then uh, the athletic department made a, a, another run at volleyball, uh, I believe in 2000. And yeah, that was uh, Bubba Cunningham, who is now I think the AD at North Carolina, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And uh, he was more of a business guy, you know, which is what a lot of the, you know, athletic directors are now. These guys that uh, weren't necessarily football or basketball coaches or guys that are more looking at how you're going to fund the athletic department. And he came in and he decided he was going to chop about four or five sports and volleyball was one of them. And he did manage to eliminate some 
Uh, I'm not sure what all was on the chopping block at that time, but he did eliminate some, but he really forced the volleyball community and the alumni at Ball State to band together and, um, and come up with a sufficient amount of money to, to keep the program alive, which was pretty neat. But that's, that just tells you the strength of this volleyball program, similar to what Stanford had to do. Yes, uh, this past same, year. exactly the same they gonna, thing. They were going to, you know, uh, eliminate that program and a program that had produced Olympians at Stanford and, and a, a, a university has got more money than they know what to do with. Uh, but it, in, in hopes of developing a better football and basketball team, they were going to eliminate, eliminate volleyball. And I'm sure that's what the plan was at Ball State too, but it didn't go because uh, the alumni and friends of, of volleyball in this area all got together and, and supported it and, and kept it alive. But for a long time, Terry, they didn't have, wasn't fully funded the way Ohio State was or some other of these programs were. And now just now it's getting back to a point where it has the full number of scholarships and is getting the type of budget that it needs to have to be successful in, at the division one level. And, and for people that don't know, in men's volleyball, full complement of scholarships is it was five, I believe. What I, think it's, I think it's 4.5. 4.5, right. I think that's the number, yeah. Right. Um, so um, Steve played in the mid-70s, was a setter in the mid-70s. You were on your dad's team in what years? Well, Steve was a senior when I was a freshman. Okay. And, you know, it's funny because I was telling this story. You may not think it's funny, but I was telling this story to some some people the other day, because now with this portal and all the movement of players back and forth and coming into teams, you know, you've got to be really careful on who you bring in at what time without alienating half your team. And uh, because if, you know, if you got a, a transfer coming in, we actually had a kid from Michigan state, a really good player that, that came in and was looking at us and one other schools, she actually selected the other school. Um, but we had some players that, you know, were concerned that here came this player that might take away, you know, their, their spot. And I'm thinking back that when I went to Ball State, my brother Steve was a senior, there wasn't another setter there except me and I was a freshman. But by the time I got to be a sophomore, the head coach at Ball State had brought in a junior college transfer and another really good freshman of play behind there. And now all of a sudden there was a battle again, you know, and I'm thinking, I never thought I never thought a second about that. I thought that was just the way that it was. You know, there's competition. You, you know, you're on a team. The coach's job is to bring the best players in that they can find. And if that's you, great. If it's not you, you better work harder. And uh, and and that that year I played a lot. Uh, Bob Halbadell was a from Kellogg Community College. He was a setter that came in, and he and I ran a six-two uh, until I I twisted my ankle playing intramural basketball, and uh, that put me out for the rest of the season. And really never got back to, to where I was in the mix at, at a high level after that, as there were then even additional setters came on the scene after that. So, I mean, it kind of ties right into, I think, what the world we're going to right now in, in college athletics. But then, you know, Johnny was a great player. Johnny was an All-America player. Johnny and Steve were the, were the best volleyball players in our family, without a doubt. And, and they had great careers. And Johnny was a, a real strong club player. As a kid, and and uh, he was the tallest of the three of you. Yeah, um, yeah. Guy's and, about six uh, two, and he's left-handed. Yeah. Um, so the portal, uh, you know, it, it the the cows or the sheep are out of the barn now, so that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. But what type of structure would make it better? What what things need to happen so that it isn't quite as chaotic as it is right now. Certainly, once those those players that are getting a fifth year, once they're through, mm -hmm. it'll it'll thin down a little bit. But if if you could make some adjustments to it, what would they be? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I I try to figure out how is this education? I mean, how are we how are we really doing what's best? I, and I, we're trying to do what's best for the athlete. You know, in the last couple of years, Everything has gone to whatever we can do to give the athletes the best opportunity to enjoy what they're doing. And, and I think that's, that's valuable. Um, but for, for athletes to leave, and I'm not saying that's the case, been ever the case at Purdue or anywhere else, but a lot of them are leaving just because that pick the year they didn't play, or they may not get a chance to be right in the lineup next year. And the idea of having athletes, student athletes come to a place and learn the process 
and, and, and earn their way into a position, those, those days may be over in, in a lot of cases. Um, I, I can't answer your question as far as what would be a, a great idea. There should be some communication. I mean, I think an athlete and a coach should have a conversation before that particular player goes on the portal. That's not part that's of the program happening. right now. That, 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 that's not necessary. That, they can just go right to compliance and say, I, I went on the portal. And they can be on the portal in 10 minutes. And, and I had a Division One coach tell me uh, three weeks ago that two players contacted him. They wanted to transfer to that school. Neither one had ever been on campus, met the coaches, met the team. They just knew they wanted to go there, which mm -hmm. is, it sounds like you're choosing a, uh, a, a trip over, over spring vacation rather than, than changing colleges. So does a school have a responsibility to provide some mentoring to these people as they choose to leave? They should, but I don't think that's part of the program right now. Um, I, I do think they've got to go in and talk to compliance. Compliance does have some, a checklist that they, they go over with them before they can be put on, on the portal. I really don't know what all, all is on that. I've, been, I've not been given uh, that list to look at, but I, I think what happened, Terry, was when we went through the COVID and, and half the players that committed to schools during that time were, had never visited their campus. None of them were. They couldn't, they couldn't have visits. They weren't allowed to visit campuses. And so there was a lot of people making decisions at that point in time. Maybe they and their parents you know, came out and, and walked the campus on their own, but they could not see a coach while they were there. They could not go inside the facility while they were there. So I think it became easy then. Well, I didn't make, I didn't see my, didn't make a visit the last time I made a decision. Why do I need to make one now? Well, it didn't work out that well the last time. So, um, but I, I don't know. I, I do think there should be some, some uh, ground rules for how that can work and, and better the athlete and the whole situation. Any coach who's really doing a good job is going to require things of an athlete. It's not easy. I'm sure it's not easy to play volleyball at Purdue. It's not easy to play at Kentucky or Nebraska or any program where a coach is trying to, to push people out of their comfort zone. But with the portal the way it is right now, somebody can have a tough practice or a tough match or a tough end of the season and just think, wow, I'd like to play at the same level, but I'm, I'm thinking this other place, maybe they – I can be more comfortable. Nobody's, nobody's going to be asking me to do something different or better. Is that, is that a fair analysis or is it, am I really being unfair? Uh, I think both. I mean, I think that we don't know what's going through the players' minds. We don't know why any particular player decides to leave their team and that particular school. So I, I think it might be unfair uh, to assume it was because they had a tough practice or things right. didn't go well or whatever else. Yes, so I, I think, I think we have to be careful about that. I do think there are people that are on social media and they think, boy, that program looks like it'd be a lot of fun to play at a lot more fun than this situation I've got here. So maybe I'll just get on the portal and see what happens. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do think there is some of, of that going on. I mean, I just think that's the, the world we're living in social media as you know, Terry has changed everything. Oh. And, and that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I, if, my, if my sports information person isn't flooding social media with stuff, I'm not happy as a coach. Because right. I know they're doing that at Nebraska and Minnesota and Wisconsin and Ohio State and everywhere else, okay? So we, we've got to have that presence out there. And the presence is to influence recruits. We're not trying to influence transfers. I've never, I never felt like anything we're doing is to try to tr influence a kid from Ball State who's their best player to come to Purdue. I, I don't need that, okay? But we do need to be seen by the, the best re recruits in high school in the country and help them understand, you know, what Purdue's about and, and what, what the program looks like. Yeah, I, I noticed that almost all the schools are posting the birthdays of players. Is, is, that, is that getting a little bit too too much information um do they do they give how old they are or they just say happy birthday 
they just say today's so and so's birthday. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think they, the players mind that. Um, I've not had anybody come to me and say, "Please don't mention it's my birthday today." Yeah. Um, that might be scrutinizing things a little bit too much. Um, yeah, I just think some, some people. One of my former players, I, I mentioned that on uh, on our coaching page, and and she mentioned that four players when she was at Nebraska had been stalked by people. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, there's so much information out there. If you have somebody's birth date, then you have one more thing right. about how to get even, uh, yeah. even more in, information about them. But it certainly has been marketing. Uh, marketing is, is everything. And uh, uh, I've, it, it seems like it has steamrolled, like there's considerably more now than there was a month ago. It's just becoming... Uh, over. And, and you think during the off season it would slow down, right? Oh no, no, it's so, not. And and that's because recruiting is just now starting to pick up again. As I mentioned to you off the air, you know this this weekend, you know there's going to be a blue million of people, a blue million coaches in Kansas City and St. Louis and and other places across the country because it's the first time we're allowed to be out recruiting. And a lot of these coaches really need players. Most of the of the you know, Big Ten, Power Five, we're pretty much done with the current senior and junior class. And those are the only people that you can really have visit or you can communicate with directly. So we're not really having to work that hard. And gen generally speaking, I know there are some that do, and, and, and we're certainly going to be out looking at a particular uh, uh, a senior, actually, okay? But um, there's never going to be a time where I think you're going to call the dogs off on social media. I just think you've got to just keep, keep pushing it because the fear is, is that somebody else is doing a better job than you are like everything else in life. Yeah. And that may not be the right philosophy. Okay. But I just think that that's, that's part of it. Well, we're not going back, but I, I remember years ago when I, we needed one more player and I, I contacted Bill Feldman who ran a recruiting service at Chicago. Yeah. I know Bill. always trusted him because I thought he, his evaluations were pretty spot on. But I said, I told him what I was looking for. And he said, well, I've never seen this girl play. She doesn't play club volleyball. She's from Western Iowa. And so I, I went and watched her play basketball and offered her a scholarship. She was six foot four and she became a three-time All-American. That's not yeah. possible now. I mean, it's yeah. not possible to go out and shake the limbs and find somebody or maybe have to go to a foreign country to do it. Mm -hmm. Or some schools are considering whether or not they should focus entirely on transfers. Now I can't see Purdue doing that, but maybe if you're a team in the in the Big Ten that hasn't won but a couple matches, uh, can you see coaches going in that direction? Well, I think there'll be a lot of people that will have a blend of bringing in high school age kids, but also saving um, scholarships for the portal to use on transfers. When you look at college basketball, you look at the teams that are performing at the highest level, they're these teams whose average age is 21 and a half. You know, they're older players, they're experienced players. They're not the, the what Duke, you know, used to be where they ha had all those one and done players. They're, they're programs that are getting more experienced players and they're going and getting these kids that are fifth year kids. And as you mentioned, we're not going to see that for after three more years, we won't see the fifth year kids anymore. Right. Uh, but I, I, I think there will be people that will focus on, on the transfers. Certainly when you communicate with a 22 year old uh, on a telephone or when they come on a visit, it's totally different than talking to a 16 year old. And as far as finding people that no one else has seen before, that got a lot harder when the recruiting rules prevented you from getting a commitment until somebody was a junior in high school, which you know, is used to, used to be, you could find a freshman. Um, I remember Retke um, from Wisconsin. She sent out um, uh, some video to, uh, you know, whether it was big 10 schools or wherever else got it. And we certainly saw it, but we didn't move on it right away. Well, credit Wisconsin. They did. I mean, they moved on it right away. And, uh, and, and they made something happen, but she was just a freshman when she sent that out. And at that point in time was only about six, five. Um, but it's, it's going to be interesting. I think it has controlled it with the rules. The NCAA has put in were good rules as far as, and it wasn't the NCAA that put it in. It was our coaches association 
that suggested those rules of not allowing visits until uh, I think it was it's July or September 1st, maybe of their junior year or July 1st. I can't remember what it is right now, but um, it certainly helped control the recruiting mm -hmm. in volleyball. You mentioned Redke and she's, she's a once in a program type athlete, but uh, she, she's six, eight, Smrex six, nine, mm -hmm. but the game that we're playing in college and we're playing throughout the United States is not the game that's being played anywhere else in terms of substitutes. So mm -hmm. what, what we're, what we're seeing more and more of 15 subs plus a libero. Uh, so a lot of these taller athletes who could be exceptional passers aren't being trained. Clubs want to win. So they just spend time training those kids in the front row. They train smaller kids in the back row, uh, which means that, um, as, as our players move through college to the national team, finding uh, a, a couple outside hitters or who, who can pass the ball can be difficult because passing is so critical. It's become so much more difficult in the last, uh, in the last four or five years. Um, I don't think we'll ever go back. There's too much pressure to, uh, to have more kids on a roster. But if you could, would the game be better if we had eight subs instead of 15? I think that depends on your perspective, uh, Terry. I mean, the perspective you used earlier was, how do we make our national team better? I mean, how do we get these kids ready so when they go on the national team, where Karch is going to train 15 to 18 players to, to be the best in the world? But my, my point would be this, is that you're, you're able to let, allow a lot more people play the game the way we're doing it. Anybody under five foot seven may not be able to play the game. If, if we're just going to have the international rules for substitution. But, but I would make this argument, Dave, if we went to eight subs, you would see the return of the great 5'11", six foot outside hitter because passing, passing would be the most important thing you'd have to look at when, and, and so it would also be a redistribution of size. Right now, if you look at the rosters, the biggest players are in power five schools for the most part. Mm -hmm. But if Purdue goes into a match knowing we have to have three pin hitters or two pin hitters that can pass, play six rotations, um, then that changes who you recruit, doesn't it? Well, certainly. Yeah, I won't argue with, with that fact that it would open the door for more athletes that are in that 5'11", six foot, six foot one range, possibly that can do everything. I, I don't argue that at all. I just think it certainly makes it difficult for um, kids who are five foot five to play the game of volleyball. Why do you think so many coaches came out of Ball State? Um, I mean, it's, to me, that's just really odd that that many that many people, that many successful coaches, uh, Craig Skinner wins a national championship. Mick Haley wins national championships. Um, I, you know, uh, Sheffield. Kelly, Kelly Sheffield ne never played volleyball. The, yeah. the only other coach I can think of who won a national championship, I, I wonder if Chuck Irby ever played, played a game. Maybe not. Yeah. But, but, the, but the fact is, Ball State impacted Kelly Sheffield. He oh, was yeah. around those people. He was around those coaches. So what happened there that it became a, a hotbed for developing coaches? Well, obviously it started with, with Dr. Don, um, who built the program. Ball State is a teach was it what used to be called Ball State Teachers College, as you probably remember. Yeah. It wasn't Ball State College or Ball State University. It was Ball State Teachers College. And the focus was on developing educators to go out into the world to, to teach all the different subjects in school. And so what happened was so many of these guys that were playing at Ball State originally, okay, were in, went out and continued to teach. And they went to high schools. And they also went to clubs. And the, the, the best example is the Muncieana Volleyball Club, where it was basically a lot of former Ball State players and they were training other 
teachers and coaches in the area. The younger, the players at Ball State were, were also coaching at the Muncie program while they were playing at Ball State. They enjoyed it and that was their, their fix. And all of a sudden we started flooding the area with, with coaches. And, and the word was that Ball State's developing great coaches. And so other coaches would come in and draw assistant coaches you know, even as you know, Terry, there didn't used to be assistant coaches. It was all your head coach, or maybe if you were lucky, your program had one assistant coach. But fortunately, Ball State developed a lot of these people. They, they, in Indiana, became a hotbed based on what Ball State did. The play, the coaches they developed, both male and female, that were coming out of Ball State University. But I think a lot of it was that it's a teaching school, and we had the right people at the top. You know, I, I like you know West Lyon very well. Right. You know, my brother, Steve, very well. Right. Those are the first two guys that really started the Muncieana program. And what better role models to be than those two that were that were in the Muncie school system, teaching and coaching. And then what Steve did was develop this program that was remarkable at Muncie Burris. And everybody admired what was going on there. They were, you know, they, they turned Muncie into a volleyball town, mm -hmm. along with what the men's program did at Ball State. And I just think so many players came out of uh, they're wanting to stay involved in the game and, and that helped a little bit. I don't know if that's a, a clear answer, but I think the teacher's college thing is a big part of it and the success Ball State had in volleyball and then what some of the initial, you know, I go back to Mick Haley, you know, and Mick stuck around this area and, and also did some coaching. Tom Beerman uh, was a longtime coach in the state of Indiana and trained a lot of other people under his, under his wings as well. Yeah. And Mick, I, Mick, I think tried to play baseball at Ball State and, when he found out he wasn't going to be as competitive in that, I think your dad recruited him to the, yeah. the volleyball team. That, that's how dad, just real quick, that's how dad got majority of his players the first 15, 20 years was they got cut off the basketball team or he saw them in PE class. Um, and that's how he recruited. He, he wasn't out recruiting the, the beaches of Southern California for players to come to Muncie. Uh, there was very little volleyball being played by men back then. So he had to, he had to develop those guys and, uh, at Ball State. So we went to Thanksgiving. Were you calling your dad Dr. Don or, or <laughs> at, um, at what point? I'm, at what I'm point not sure when change? that happened, but, uh, but certainly uh, that is what I what I called him most of the time. Yeah, Dr. Don. I think uh -huh. that's kind of common knowledge right now. I occasionally I might call him dad. I, I saved a lot of his um, uh, voicemails that, that he would he would make, you know, during his last uh, two or three years. And he, every time he'd, he'd call, he'd say, David, this is your father. And then, <laughs> then, he, then, he, then he would tell me, tell me what, uh, what he was calling about. Usually he was thanking me for something. He was thanking me for sending him something or coming over to see him or thanking me for, for my wife going over and dropping some things off for him. But it was always a, uh, David, this is your father. And uh, <laughs> thanks so much for something. Uh, you know, yeah. I, when I think of when I think of you and your family, it's it's a kind of a combination of the Waltons and the Cartwrights. It's but but it's definitely a family operation. I mean, you you pay a, a, a lot of tribute to your wife Angie. Mm -hmm. uh, your kids played volleyball. Uh, your son is a coach now. Is it at is it at, at Huntington? Men's coach at Indiana Tech in Fort Indiana Wayne, Tech. and they're they're fourteen and zero. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> they finished fifth last year in the Nationals at NAIA, and he has about everybody back, so they're, they're pretty good. Good. And uh, and your daughter, your daughter played for you, correct? My daughter Lindsay uh, originally went to Cal State Fullerton before I was here, and then I got the job here, and she realized that I wouldn't be out watching her play out in Fullerton in the Big West Conference, so she decided to come back here, and, and she walked on here at Purdue, and her her final season she helped run a 6-2 offense that we went to the sweet 16 with so she wasn't very big five foot five but uh, she sat while she was in the back row and she's done a lot of coaching uh, since then and as well as uh, she's got four kids all between the ages of three and seven I mean is it possible to sit down with your family and not talk about volleyball no not really <laughs> not really it comes up quite a bit and uh, you know Steve's the only one now back it's still left in Muncie my brother Steve Mm -hmm. is uh, the only one that's in Muncie. John and I are, are over here. My sister Kim is in, uh, in Fort Wayne, but she just retired as an educator and she's moving to with her husband down to Indianapolis where her four daughters 
are all living right now. Now, I think your dad originally was from Fort Wayne. Is that he was? He went to Fort Wayne Central, and uh, he was involved more in baseball and track when he was there. That's kind of what he came down hoping to do at Ball State, but couldn't quite cut the mustard there. So he went uh, uh, on that men's volleyball club, and that's kind of where it all began. Here, here's another point of interest that nobody will have any interest in other than me. But I went to Manchester, which yeah. was less than an hour from Fort Wayne. In four years there, I went to Fort Wayne once. Yeah. Okay. Now here, here's the, the difference. Well, it, yes, that was the big city. Yeah. But it, we just played basketball all the time. I mean, yeah. it, you you went to school and then you went over to the gym and played played basketball and you thought it was wonderful. Uh, when my daughter was in seventh grade, she went to Italy with her class. I mean, it's yeah. just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a difference. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's a big difference. Um, all right. This year in the Big Ten, Purdue beats Nebraska twice. No. no I'm sorry. Nebraska beats Purdue twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wisconsin beats Nebraska twice. And Purdue beats Wisconsin twice. Mm -hmm. Is is this about matchups? What's what What was happening there? I think matchups are really big in the sport of volleyball. Mm -hmm. And I also think timing is important uh, when you play somebody in the sport of volleyball, especially lately with all the things that have been going on um, from a health standpoint. And uh, I, mean, I look at, I mean, just recently, I'd say the same thing in men's basketball. Purdue was, is one of the best basketball teams in the country right now. They're, they've got great size and they've got great shooting. But because a lot of games were canceled early in the season, the Big Ten's been playing about three games a week for right. the last couple of weeks. And it shows on these teams. Mm -hmm. And I think you saw some of that some in, in, in volleyball. Um, obviously, Nebraska is really, really good. Um, when we played Nebraska at their place, we were without a couple of, of players. Um, Non-COVID-related. Um, but we didn't play JL Johnson. We didn't play Marissa Horning. Um, and they beat us pretty good um, up there. I mean, I shouldn't say that. The, the games were competitive, but they beat us. Then they came down here. And I go to the timing again. I don't think it was that big of an issue, but, but we played them right after my dad passed away. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of emotion that was, was spent during that week um, that wasn't volleyball related. Uh, but I will also say this, that we played Nebraska twice in the last third of the season. And if we'd have played Nebraska in the first third of the season, we'd had a much better chance of beating them because they really got better and played, were playing really well at the end of the year. But with matchups, it's huge. I thought we, we controlled Retke pretty well because our left side block is big and physical, because we served tough enough that we could dictate what they were going to do offensively, and our middle blockers could get a, a jump start on either going to get Retke or going to get the outside hitter based on where the ball was passed. So I, I am a believer that matchups are really, really important. Um, but I thought we had a decent matchup with Pitt at the end of the season, and it, it didn't work out that well. And, and what was, you know, what was, I, I watched that match. What didn't work out for you? When you went into it, what did you think you could well, we, leverage that didn't work out? We had, I mean, conceivably our best player was Grace Cleveland. And Grace mm -hmm. was a six, three and a half inch opposite. And, um, and one of their better left side hitters was a, a five foot, eight inch jumping jack. But we liked that matchup because we felt like Grace could contain their hitter and that we should be able to get the ball to Grace and she should be able to score going over the top. And, and some, of that, some of that happened, by the way, okay? It's just that their little kid was moving all over the place and we had a hard time catching up with where she was. They set a really fast tempo ball. And it's, it's like, until you, until you see that fast tempo live, you can't really create that um, in practice the way you'd like to on a regular basis, especially when you have minimal time. You're going from playing BYU on one night to playing uh, two nights later, you're playing Pitt. And their tempo is different. Their, their game was different. And um, it, it's hard to create that fast tempo and have your players because you're not trying to do too much on that day in between anyway, except keep your kids rested 
you've gotten this far, you want to do something, but not do so much. You're going to have Newton's legs tired before she plays in the, in the match that might get you to the final four. Have you ever read any, any Thomas tank engine books to your grandchildren? I don't know if I have or not. <laughs> What's, what are some of the books? What's the name well, of the book? you know who Thomas tank engine is. Tom, yeah. Thomas tank engines kind of like the little train that could. Yeah. And I, I think through the first half of your career at Purdue, I, I kind of think that my, my sense was that you kind of operated like Purdue's the little train that can. Yeah. Maybe we don't have we don't have the resources that maybe Penn State has or Nebraska has or Minnesota has. That's fair. But but you just told me Purdue basketball's possibly one of the best one or two teams in the country. Women's basketball's won a national championship. Is is Purdue volleyball laying the foundation to win a national championship? Well, that's our plan. Right. Um, but I mean, know, but I mean, what, what do you lack that would, that Minnesota has or Penn state has or Nebraska has? Nothing, nothing. We have no excuse uh, for why we, um, you know, didn't get to the final four this year. We, I mean, except that Pittsburgh was ranked third in the country. And I think it's important to get that match at home. You know, as you know, Terry, that right, the top right. four seeds, get to right. play at home. Right. And uh, we were really close to that because Penn State could have easily have beaten Pitt um, in the, uh, I guess that would have been the Sweet 16. Maybe a fair question would be, yeah. when did you realize Purdue could win a national championship in volleyball? At what point in your career, uh, you know, I, uh, when you came to Purdue, you were reviving a program that had once been a great program had fallen in hard times. You got it turned pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, at what point did you realize we have the resources here to win a national championship or compete for a national championship? Well, I, I think that the resources that we have are one, we got a great institution and we have a wonderful facility and, and Purdue supports their volleyball program at a really, really high level. They give us everything from a budget standpoint that we need. What happens is though, is that we, we necessarily can't go out just from name recognition or from past history. We may not out recruit Texas and Nebraska and Penn State and Stanford and Florida for the same kid on a regular basis. They're gonna get maybe a few more of those kids, well, we, or those players. What we have to do is find the same athlete. So we're, we're not looking necessarily for an accomplished high school player as much as a great athlete. And then we have to get that athlete into the gym and train them, which is what we do really well. And in hopes that by the time they're needed, they're gonna be able to play against Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Penn State, Ohio State, Illinois, Michigan, and, and be very competitive. Um, you know, Danielle Catino, if you remember Catino that's playing in Brazil right now, uh, came out of Indianapolis. And um, she was as good of an athlete as there was in the Big 10 this year, last year, the year before. And we rode her as long, as far as we could. It'd have been nice to have another one like her. Uh, one year we had Catino and Atkinson. One was 6'5", and the other was 6'4", but our ball control wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you got to have all those things. I mean, you look at Nebraska this year, and yeah, their offense was not as good as a typical Nebraska team. No, but it they, wasn't. They, 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 they still had some, some physical specimens. I mean, you know, they had some specimens that could put the ball away if they were in system but their defense kept them in every game. Their defense was remarkable. One of the best defensive teams that I've seen in a, maybe in, ever in the Big Ten. Um, but I mean, I, I don't have a good answer for your, your question. I mean, I, I think that in our league, you know, we right now we're to a point we can beat anybody in the Big Ten. Well, and if you can do that, you can win a national championship. You can win a national championship. But things have got it. Sometimes they've got to get lined up right. And, and we have not played great matches in that regional final. We've been there four times in the last 11 years. We've not played great matches. Two of those, we had chances to win. I, mean, I thought we had a chance to beat Kentucky last year, but Kentucky was on fire at that tournament up in Omaha. And then I thought we had a, a really good chance to win at Pitt, and we just didn't play well enough. Right. Um, Mike Lingenfelder said this about, uh, about 
Purdue. He said, with every Shondell team, it wasn't about what they were going to do, but what they were never going to do. I thought that was a wonderful quote about, uh, about you, meaning that Purdue is Purdue, Dave Shondell's teams are never going to beat themselves. You have to go out and play well to beat them. You think that's pretty accurate? I hope so. I mean, we work on being fundamentally sound and being well prepared and playing smart and putting people on the floor that, that want to compete. Uh, I think, you know, you go back to what we were talking about before. You have to have an enormous amount of competitors on your team to do what you're talking about to win a national championship. Um, you know, Sheffield put, put, put some great competitors on the floor at Nebraska, at Wisconsin. But we've got to get, you know, we go out and find these athletes, and that's what recruiting is. You know, I think recruiting is easy. Just go find great athletes. Well, they got to be great athletes that are coachable and compete right. and are, and are going to play well together. And, and the, the leadership component has to be there. And so you got to put all those things together. But I, I, it just hasn't been our time yet, you know, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. It just hasn't been our time yet. But our, 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 we believe our time is coming. I think this year is going to be a little bit tougher for us. We're going to be a little bit green, but so is everybody because they're all losing, you know, two classes in once, that super senior class and the senior class. So it'll be really interesting this year to see who, who steps up. But we've got some great players coming. Uh, to Purdue and what we've done the last couple of years has helped us because everybody has seen us on TV about 19 times a year and they've, they've watched the way we play. And so it's not, it's been easier to recruit those kind of players to Purdue in the last three years than it was any other time that I've been here. Mm -hmm. What well, What is the big 10 doing right? Why, why has it become the best conference in division one volleyball? But, I think, first of all, the support that the, the universities provide. I think um, the Big Ten Conference was one of the very first to say, we're going to support women's athletics. You know, these institutions are going to support women's athletics. And I know Purdue has done that. And I, and I think they've done that across the board. And so that's allowed us to not only have the, the budgets that we need to have to recruit and, and travel and those type of things, uh, but also to market our sport. And, you know, there's only a, maybe two or three programs in the Big Ten that aren't getting two and a half to 9,000 people a match. Mm -hmm. I mean, the crowds are awesome in the Big Ten. And then, the, then with the Big Ten network coming on board about, I don't know, when was that, 12, 15 years ago? Seems like, okay. Now, all of a sudden, every high school player in the country or elementary player in the country has access to big, well, most of them, the Big Ten Network, and they're looking at those crowds, and they're seeing those players. And so everybody grows up thinking, I want to play in the Big Ten. Not everybody, but a lot of them want to play in the Big Ten because of what they have seen on the Big Ten Network because of what's been provided by these athletic departments to help make volleyball great. And right now, uh, volleyball is the third highest ranked sport on the Big Ten Network behind football and men's basketball. So women's volleyball is next in line. And so they're doing a great job of marketing that and people are wanting to watch women's, women's volleyball. Right. What does Annie Drew's success do for Purdue volleyball? Well, it did a lot for, for me. I mean, I, I thought it was the greatest thing <laughs> in the world. I, I mean, it was a dream come true for our program to have not only a player make the Olympic team um, and not to to eventually start on the Olympic team and lead the team in kills, but most importantly, win the first gold medal for women's volleyball yeah. in the Olympics. I mean, that's, I don't think we felt all that yet, what, what that's gonna, what that's gonna do, uh, not only for us, but for her um, and, and everything down the road. But we, we couldn't even get her back um, for a match because she was so busy with the end of that Olympics and, and getting organized, she got COVID, and couldn't come to a match. And then she had to be over in Japan uh, right away, getting ready to play on, on her pro team over there. So she couldn't even get back. We had an Annie Drews night. We had an Annie Drews bobblehead. I could show you that if I could find it, but it's over on the, over there. We had a bobblehead <laughs> night for her and she couldn't even be there. Her mom and dad had to kind of represent her on that night. Well, what a, what a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing to have happen. I have a fondness for Purdue. I, I grew up, uh, I guess I'm about an hour and, 15 minutes from campus. And uh, 
uh, I've written many times that I don't think there's a, a better looking place in the world than Northern Indiana in, in early June. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's where I grew up in. I, it's where I, it's still my home, even though there's no one there anymore, yeah. but it's, it's still, uh, still who I am. Before we, before we leave here, what do you call that when you're pulling the steam on that steam engine? You call that jacking or what I don't is know it? What they, I don't know what they call We just call it boiler up. <laughs> okay, I'm let's not sure what they, what they call what, it, but this you, move just means boiler up. Well, you know what that's from? That's from grabbing the whistle on a steam engine. Right, right. I, oh, I get that well, part of it. Okay, all right. Give us that. I'm not sure they're doing much of that anymore, but. Yeah, well, but <laughs> give us a couple of those on our way out here. Dave. All right here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Boiler up. Boiler up. <laughs> thanks so much for being a guest. Well, thanks, Terry. I hope it was uh, was fairly productive, but I appreciate you bringing me on to talk about my dad, my family, and, and Purdue. That's it for this episode of Inside the Coaching Mind with your host, Coach Terry Pettit. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, or just talking about it over a cup of coffee. All the ways to subscribe are posted on terrypettit.com. And don't forget to look for our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind with Terry Pettit. I'm Dave Young. We'll talk to you next time for the next episode of Inside the Coaching Mind.